In the bulletin, we read, The book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall read and meditate it on it day and night, day and night, so that you may be careful to do everything in accordance with all that is written in it, for then you will make your way prosperous, and then you will be successful. This is eternally success. This is eternal success. And then he says, And have I not commanded you, be strong and courageous. Do not be terrified or dismayed, intimidated for what happens to you, for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. What comforting words these are in this day of, of uh, trial and tribulation. Amen? So, let us continue to put all of our faith and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, in these... Uh, we talked about this last week, but in, in these seven churches that Jesus is speaking to, uh, are, they were actual churches in, in Asia, in, uh, specifically in areas of Turkey. And there were seven specific churches, but these seven specific churches... Um, each had a different characteristic, some good, some bad. Um, they were seven real churches. But not only did these seven churches represent seven churches in that 1900 years ago, the, sec the second thing these churches represent is that they existed, these type of churches existed throughout the ages, throughout the age of the churches. And then not only that, there's a third meaning of these seven churches. These seven churches also represented seven general periods of time of the church throughout the church history. In other words, um, just like a baby is born, uh, it's a baby and then it becomes a toddler, then a preschooler, a preteen, a teenager, a young person, and eventually an adult. Churches go, can and still go through stages as well. Sometimes they're up, sometimes they're down. It's, it's an important uh, footnote that there's a good number of churches who obeyed God's word and there was a good number of churches who did not obey God's word during this, this church history time. Now, Let me share some things with you in, in review. In the church of Ephesus, that represents the first century from the time Jesus ascended into heaven until 99 AD. This is the first century. The, the Ephesus church represented the first century and they had some very good works, but they had already begin, began to, love, to lose their first love of the Lord Jesus Christ. This first love is, a, is that burning, yearning, and bridal type love. When you first get married, you're excited, you're enthusiastic. But the Ephesus church had lost that first love. And we don't want to lose that first love either. Because when you lose the first love, your church begins to die. And we don't want to to lose our first love. And it doesn't matter if it's a small church or a big church, you can lose that first love and that church will die. Amen. And just become a, a fraternity or an organization or a social club or, or, or just a place to, uh, to uh, meet other people. Yeah. But it's not his church. Jesus said, if you don't repent from, from losing your first love, I will remove my, my lampstand, my candlestick, from your church, meaning he'll remove the authority of them being his church. Well, that was in the first century. In the second, uh, second church was from the fourth century, or from the first century to the fourth century. Now, this church suffered great persecution under Roman emperors, under the Caesars of Rome. They were persecuted heavily, and they were a poor church. Jesus said, even though they were severely persecuted and poor, he said to Smyrna, you are rich. You are rich. Why? Because they had him. They had him. 
And he was going to give them the entire kingdom of heaven. Now, the third uh, church was called Pergamos. And this was during the fourth and fifth centuries. So in uh, 300 to 499. Now, Christianity, uh, the Roman emperors decided, decided to make the, Christ, the Christian faith the Roman f state faith. They decided instead of persecuting the Christians, let's make Christianity our religion because they saw the strength of the, of the, of the uh, belief that these believers had in the Lord Jesus Christ, that nothing could break them from that. The true born-again believers. Nothing could break them from that. And they said, well, instead of fighting them and persecuting them, let's, let's make Christianity our state religion. But they didn't do it the right way. They didn't do it the, the right way. They brought in all kinds of false doctrines. They brought in false practices. Um, and that continued in, uh, in, the, in the fourth and fifth centuries. Now the next church, Thyatira, was from the sixth century to the 15th century. Now, during this time, the Roman Catholic Church largely held great deal of influence in Western Christendom in, until it was rocked by Reformation. In other words, the Roman Catholic Church had great power, great sway, but they again allowed false doctrine to come in to uh, the church. And I, and, I, and I believe God eventually removed hit the candlestick from that church. Now, even though, and it was during the, the, during the 15th century that Reformation began. In other words, the Roman Catholic Church was suppressing the truth of God, but the Reformation was starting to allow the, the Word of God to become spread and revived. The, 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 uh, the printing press, Gutenberg, uh, invented the printing press in 14, 1480 or 90 or something like that. And that's when they started printing the Bible, printing the words in people's languages so they could read the word from the cell for themselves. Before that time, it was very hard for them, first of all, to learn how to read, and second of all, to get, some, to get the Bible to, be, to, to read it. And because the, 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 the Roman church suppressed the, the truth of God's word. Now, during this Reformation, uh, there were many religions that came out of the Roman church. I'm giving you some church history. They came out of the Roman church. Uh, the, the Lutherans, the Presbyterians, the Methodists, the Episcopalians, all kinds of denominations came out of the Roman Catholic Church in this Reformation period. And they, they realized that Rome was not following God's word. That's, that's the, the main thing we, we get from that. But I want to remind you that even though these churches came out of the Roman church, some of them didn't come out far enough. And besides these churches, even though the Roman church held, held great power and sway, there were many churches that had never succumbed to the false teaching of the Roman church. And some of these uh, faithful Christian churches were called uh, Montanists. Some of them were called Novationists. Some were called Donat Donatists. Some were called Pauliceans. Some were called El Albigenesis. Some of them were called Waldenses. Except some of them were called Anabaptists. They finally just dropped the Anna part and Baptist. Now, that doesn't mean that all Baptists are right and all Baptists are still holding true to the Word of God, but it was these, these churches that remained faithful in spite of what was being taught and preached during those uh, long years. Now, in the, in the uh, next church, Sardis, that was between the 16th and 17th century. This is where the Reformation uh, 
was the post-Reformation. It was after uh, this, this great Reformation took place, it started to dim. The truth started to dim again. But then in, in, uh, in, in the uh, sixth church, Philadelphia, in the 16th and 17th centuries, uh, there was a great worldwide revival. Great worldwide revival. Throughout England and, um, and, and uh, colonial, colonial America and throughout the world, there was great revival. There was uh, great missionary movements occurring throughout the world during the, the 17 and 1800s. Now, we've done uh, the first five churches, uh, no, the first six churches, no, five, and we have two more. And the next church is called Philadelphia, the one I just talked about, the re great revival area, era of the church. So in this next PowerPoint screen, we shall read, Revelation 3, 7 says, And to the angel of the church in Philadelphia, write these things, says he who is holy, he who is true, he who has the key of, of David. He who opens and no one shuts, and shuts and no one opens. I know your works. See, I have set before you an open door, and no one can shut it, for you have a little strength. strength. So be sure to fill in those, those, uh, those blanks in your, in your uh, worksheet. Have and have kept my word. They kept the word and they did not deny his name. Indeed, I will make those of the synagogue of Satan who say they are Jews and are not, but lie. He says, I will make them. And we'll see in the next PowerPoint screen what they say. But this, this again was Philadelphia, was the church age during the 18th, which is the the 1700s and 19th century, which is the 1800s. They were, they were, there were great and mighty revivals and missionary movements. Now, think about this, brothers and sisters. This was during, the great, during this great revival time period that America was forming as a nation. Remember 1776? Well, prior to that, this is the, this was the great missionary movements, the revival was taking place and America was part of that revolutionary movement. It was the pilgrims who came over. It was, and then later on, the Puritans came over and they left the persecution of the false religious Europe to start religious freedom again to worship Jesus in colonial America. Amen? To continue that revival. Now that's important. That's really important because the American colonies were formed by the word of God through the power of the seven spirits. You know who the seven spirits are? Yes. The Holy Spirit and Jesus. This is why, brothers and sisters, that even today, why the U.S. Constitution needs to be upheld. Because the U.S. Constitution is filled with direct and indirect quotes from the Bible. Our nation was formed on the Word of God. Now, that doesn't mean everybody was a Christian and everybody was doing good. No, but, but as a governmental uh, entity, our nation was formed on the Word of God. Just like Israel was formed on the Word of God, they departed from the Word of God and became uh, disobedient, and then they were exiled. But the United States was formed on the word of God. That's why we want people, we want elect people, and we want judges who stand on the Constitution because it was formed on the word of God. Now, it is, it is estimated that more than 50% of the Constitution is filled with, with the knowledge and quotes of, of the word of God. Over 50%. Over 50%. Now, it was during this church time, the church age of Philadelphia, the 17 and 1800s, that our nation was formed. And in 1776, we announced to the British that we are seceding from their, their rule and their control.
Again, that's why it's imperative that, that, that the U.S. Constitution be preserved as it is written. As we read in the next PowerPoint screen right here, it says, indeed, I will make them the false, the false, uh, <laughs> will somebody shut those doors, please? Indeed, I will make them come and worship before your feet and to know that I have loved you because you have kept my Amen. commands to persevere. I will also keep you from the hour of trial which shall come upon the whole earth to test those who dwell on the earth. Well, what is this testing? Anybody know what the testing is? Anybody? No. The test. Tribulation. The tribulation. It is the tribulation period that's going to come. God is going to pour out judgments on the earth. The seven seals, the seven trumpets, and the seven bowls of judgment. He's going to test you. But he says, I'm going to keep you from that. I'm going to keep those, those faithful believers from that. Amen? I'm glad he's going to keep us from that. I don't want to be here when God judges this earth. Amen? So he says, Behold, I am coming quickly. Hold fast what you have, that no one may take your crown, the crown of faithful living for the Lord. Now, brothers and sisters, it is difficult to live faithfully in this age. And we're going to find out about this age in just a moment as we read about our present current church age. So, This is a huge promise for those who are faithful, who remain faithful to the Lord Jesus Christ. Um, in the next PowerPoint screen, we read, He who overcomes. overcomes, I will make him a pillar in the temple of my God. Anybody want to be a pillar in the temple of God? I know I do. And he shall go out no more. I will write on him the name of my God, the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem. And after the tribulation, God brings a new a millennial reign, and then after the millennial reign, the new Jerusalem, which comes out of, down out of heaven from my God, and I will write on him my new name. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches and what he says to us. Amen? So, brothers and sisters, do we have an ear to hear what the Spirit says to the churches, to the individuals, and to us as Emmanuel Church? Do we hear? Do we hear? Sisters and brothers, we have a great chance to become the type of church, even though we're small, we have the great chance to become the type of church that Jesus is wanting us to be by being faithful to His Word, standing on His truth, living a holy, righteous life, not letting one steal our love and joy and peace from, from us. Now, just remember, many of Jesus' churches, after he rose again from the, dead, from the dead, were small house churches. So it's okay to be small as long as our love is, 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 is alive and invigorating of the Lord Jesus Christ. And that we are faithful to proclaim his mighty name. And faithful to stand on his word, even though it's not popular today to stand on his word. It's not popular. Okay, so in summary, in the next PowerPoint screen, we read, May we encourage each other to, to be those faithful, serving, loving Jesus, Jesus saints by keeping our fervent love for Jesus, by studying His Word every day and obeying His commands, by sharing the gospel of Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection, by sharing how Jesus has transformed our lives through the new birth He gave us. Amen. Amen? Let us be this church and let us be these serving saints. Well, let's continue on. The next and last church, the seventh church, is the church of Laodicea. Now, since Laodicea is representative of our current church age, 
we're going to spend a little more time and a little more details on the church of this church age. The, so let's, let's look at, the, first of all, the, the city of Laodicea was set between two major uh, trading routes. They came together, one from the north and south and one from the east and west. They came together in the Lycus Valley. Now most, most great nations or most great cities are built next to a good source of water. Laodicea did not have a good source of water. So let us read the next PowerPoint screen, what Jesus says to the church of Laodicea. And to the angel of the church of the Laodiceans write, These things says the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the Lord Jesus Christ, the beginning of the creation of God, Jesus created, co-created everything. He says, I know your works, that you are neither cold nor hot. I wish you were cold. I wish you were refreshing and invigorating or hot, healing and therapeutic. So then, because you are lukewarm, you're spiritually useless and neither cold nor hot, I will vomit you out of my mouth. That does not sound too positive, does it? Whoa, this is not good. Remember, this is said to the church age that we are living in today. This is our church age. Now, Jesus, again, is the co-creator of all creation. Laodicea is the church of the last days, pictured as a lukewarm apostate church. It is the church of liberalism and ecumenicism. Now, to be ecumenical is not only to blend in with other false beliefs, but also to blend in with culture. Isn't that what Israel did? And they disobeyed God and they got exiled. Just as we see the church today adopting our culture's immoral living standards. Now, again, because Laodicea was in between these two large trade routes, this provided Laodicea with unlimited opportunities for much commerce and trade. Ideally, again, prosperous cities are built on good water sources. Unfortunately, Laodicea was not by a good water source. They, it was more driven by trade, and its builders located where the roads crossed. Their weakness was they did not have good water. Water had to be piped into Laodicea. Cold water could come from the abundant supply at Colossae, a mountain city. But by the time it traveled 10 miles or so from the cold springs, it was lukewarm. Then about six mile, miles away was Heropolis. It's like, kind of like Idaho Springs. They had hot sulfur springs. But by the time it got to La Laodicea, it again, too, was lukewarm. Anybody like lukewarm? <laughs> I don't like lukewarm. So what does Christ mean by using the metaphor that La Laodicea was neither cold nor hot? Well, cold water stimulates and invigorates, right? There's nothing like drinking a refreshing cold glass of water on a hot day. I mean, cold, fresh water. I mean, you can drink a pop, but it doesn't satisfy like a, like a glass of water. And on a hot day, or on, and then hot water. What if your, your joints are aching and you're sore? Isn't it nice to get in a hot bath? A hot bath and, and let the warmth of the, of, the, of, the invigor, of the warmth of that water remove the tension and bring healing. So Laodicea had neither cold, refreshing water, nor did they have therapeutic healing water. They were lukewarm. So what does lukewarm water do? Christ's com Christ complaint against the Laodiceans is revealed here. It was good for nothing. The Laodicean church or the Laodicean Christian is useless to him. Lukewarm water is is emetic. Anybody know what emetic means? I didn't know what it meant. It means it induces vomiting. <laughs> um, in terms of God's work, a lukewarm Christian is useless. They are sickening to Jesus. As the head of the church, Christ cannot use lukewarm Christians in the spiritual state in which he finds them. Jesus wants us to be, as Christians, to be invigorated with his refreshing word so that we may stir the souls of the lost and encourage the believer. Right? 
a fresh, cold glass of water. Or uh, Jesus wants us again to be filled with his word and his life so that we can bring healing words of comfort to those who are struggling and need the eternal word of God infused into their aching, hurting hearts. Isn't that what, isn't that what this world needs? The refreshing, invigorating truth of God's word and the warm healing of God's word infused into their souls. That's what this, this world needs. But even though... Uh, now, a little more about Laodicea, and we'll continue on. Laodicea did have three main huge industries. The Laodiceans produced a glossy black wool that was prized by the wealthy all over the world. Now, no one knows whether this rich color came from the particular strain of sheep that they bred in the area or whether they dyed it, but the quality of, wool, of the wool was indisputable. In fact, they quartered the market in this commodity and it produced great wealth. Th this wool, this industry made Laodicea very wealthy. Their second business was medicine. Laodicea boasted of one of the most renowned medical schools in the, in the world. With it came all of its associated industries like pharmaceuticals. They produced a world-famous salve reputed to cure certain kinds of eye disease. They had another salve that, that supposedly healed ear problems. People came from all over the Roman world in search of these remedies for their ailments. This medical industry again added to the wealth of Laodicea. These two industries produced a third uh, business that multiplied their already vast wealth, and it was banking. In fact, it was said that that its assets was, was a huge center of, of currency exchanging and money lending. It is said that Cicero, anybody heard of Cicero, the Roman? It is said that he cast huge bank drafts there. So huge were its assets that when, when Laodicea was demolished by a first century earthquake, the city refused Romans, Rome's help to rebuild it. They used their own funds. So Laodicea had a monopoly in textiles, a world-renowned medical industry, and a prosperous financial center. The writers of the ancient world speak openly of their envy of the Laodicean wealth. Record after record attests to their status. Now let's read further about what Jesus said to Laodicea. In the next PowerPoint screen that we read, Because you say I am rich, and have become wealthy and have need of nothing and do not and do not know that you are wretched you are miserable you are miserable you're pitiable you're poor you're beggarly you're blind spiritually and naked your shameful deeds i counsel you to buy from me spiritual gold refined in the fire that you may be rich and white garments righteous living that you may be clothed, that that shame of your nakedness may not be revealed, and anoint your eyes with an eye salve that you may see spiritual eyesight. And as many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Therefore, be zealous and repent. This, that, that sounds a lot like Laodicea, right? It sounds a lot like America, right? We are rich. We don't think we need anything. So how does Laodicea compare to our modern church here in America and the world? Laodicea was rich, just like America's rich. Laodicea had great commerce and a lot of business. America is rich and has great trade and commerce, business commerce. But when it comes to spiritually following the absolute truth of God's word, Laodicea was apathetic. They were liberal. They were wishy-washy just like the progressive American Christian church today. Isn't that right? You see it? You see it, brothers and sisters? The progressive American Christian church is liberal, diluting God's inerrant word, which removes the transforming, cleansing power of the Holy Spirit of God. 
They're diluting the word. The word's being diluted. And you can see it being diluted all the time. Many progressive Christian churches have adopted the world's definition of what God's love is instead of what the Bible says God's love is. Love in the Bible means putting the spiritual needs of others first, specifically the repentance of sin and turning to Christ as Lord and Savior. But love in the 21st century, in the culture, means accepting or embracing anything and everything. That's not love. Accepting and embracing anything is not love because God will not accept anyone into heaven. They must be born again. They must repent of their sins. They must turn from their evil and turn to, to his righteousness and holiness. That's the truth. That's the love. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. Not only do progressive Christians redefine biblical love, they devalue God's word itself. Progressive Christian values feelings over emphasized biblical facts. We, we, we hear all the time that homosexuals say that Christians hate them. I don't hate them. They didn't hear that from me. We love them. And we love them enough to tell them the truth that if they don't repent from their sin, they're going to burn in the devil's hell for eternity. I don't want them to go there. I love them. But if I tell them that, they think I hate them. And that's false. That's false. I, love, I don't want anybody to go there. Even my worst enemy, I don't want to go there. We cannot interpret Scripture by how we feel. We must interpret Scripture by what God says it says. Amen? Amen? Progressive Christian churches, they stub small churches because it's small. in a small church, you are required to do more service. You're required to pray more, serve more, give more, give of yourself more. Isn't that right? That's true. Now, progressive American Christian churches would rather be entertained than give of themselves. Lots of people just go to church to be entertained. It's a social network. And then they go home and live like the world. If progressive American Christians give of themselves, it has to be flashy and well recognized for their efforts so that they can receive applause. Right? But here's what, here's what uh, Jesus told his disciples in the next PowerPoint screen. He says, But Jesus called them to himself and said, You know that the rulers of the Gentiles, they lord over them. Yet it shall not be among you, but whoever desires to become great among you, let him be your servant. And whoever desires to be first among you, let him be your slave. We are to be servants and slaves telling people the truth. We're not here to be in a popularity contest to get everybody to like us. We, we are to love everybody else and tell them the truth that if they don't repent from their sins, they'll die in their sins and God will require them to pay for the sin in eternity in hell. We can't let them do that. And I see we're, we're already out of time. But brothers and sisters, do you get, the, you get the picture? We can finish up next week, but do you get the picture of what's going on here? Laodicea. We're, we're, it's, it's not easy to be a Christian in this church age. In fact, if you're a Christian in this church age, people don't like you. You're despised. The greatest need that the Laodiceans have, the greatest need that American Christian, Christians have and Christian churches need is they need Jesus every day, Amen. every hour and every minute. 
And I'll close with this. So Jesus is warning both Laodicea and the progressive American churches to seek the wealth of his kingdom over the wealth of this world. Jesus is encouraging Laodicea and progressive American churches to buy spiritual gold from him because Laodicea and the progressive American churches are wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked even with all their material wealth. Remember, Jesus is speaking to today's churches and their members. And you know what? We can finish. In the next PowerPoint screen, it says, I, behold, I, Jesus, stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and dine with him and he with me. To him who overcomes, I will grant to sit with me on my throne as I also overcame and sat down with my father on his throne. Let me ask you a quick question, a very important question. As Jesus speaks to his church, where is he standing? No. The next PowerPoint screen, it says this. Where is Jesus standing? He's standing outside the door of the church. He's trying to get into his church. I know. He's, where is Jesus standing? Outside his church. Why is Jesus standing outside his church knocking on what is supposed to be his Laodicean church or his American church? Because just as society pushed Jesus out of our government, our schools, our businesses, our marketplaces, Jesus has been removed from his churches as well. Because Christians refuse to stand on Jesus' truth and commands and stand against culture's sin. Isn't that right? Isn't that true? God help us. And may we be the light. May we be the salt. May we share the truth with other people that they may know, that they may know and have an opportunity to enter the kingdom of heaven. So what will we do? In the next PowerPoint screen, it sums it up like this. It says, he who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. What will we do? What will our church do? What will you and I do? Let us listen and obey the Spirit of God, the Spirit of Jesus as he speaks to us today. And surrender and be yielded to him. Amen? Isn't that awesome, church? Isn't that awesome? We have the opportunity. God has opened the door for us. We need to go through the door and be the people he says we can be because he will strengthen you. He will strengthen us. He will give you power. He will give you love. He will give you joy. He will give you everything you need. You need not worry or fear. He's with you.